ಅಂಗಡಿಗೆ ಅದನ್ನೇ ಇತ್ತು ಸೊ ಯು ಆಲ್ ಶುಡ್ ಹವ್ ಗಾಟ್ ಅನ್ ಇಮೇಲ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ದ ರೆಸ್ಟೋರೆಂಟ್ ಸೊ ವಿಲ್ ಪ್ರಾಬ್ಲಿ ಲೀವ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ವೆಲ್ ವಿ ವಿಲ್ ಲೀವ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ ದ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಲೆಕ್ಚರ್ ಸೊ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಮೇ ಬಿ 20 ಮಿನಿಟ್ಸ್ ಬೈ ಮೆಟ್ರೋ ಸೊ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ದ ಸೇಮ್ ವೇ ಆಸ್ ಯು ಗೋ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ಟು ದ ಹೋಟೆಲ್ ಬಟ್ ಯು ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಗೆಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಬಿಫೋರ್ ಯು ಗೆಟ್ ಟು ದ ಹೋಟೆಲ್ So hello welcome everybody to the third lecture of the aspects of high energy physics here It is here right you can hear me And this also follow me so it's fine So welcome to the third lecture of the aspects of high energy physics Today we are going to discuss data reconstruction And uh what is data reconstruction so in last lecture we actually studied a little bit on how the on how the particles interact with the bulk matter and out of that bulk matter we could uh, make the tactos made of sensitive elements uh, that could transform this the passage of the particles through that matter into some kind of signal either electrical signal or light signal but that means nothing right at some point what we have to do is that we have to read out this information and format it in such a way that we can understand it in practice everything nowadays is done with computers so at some point you have to digitalize this information there tends to be a bit more uh, specific here at some point you need a transducer what is a transducer it transforms some kind of energy into some kind of some other kind This is a very generic definition but it's important to notice that uh this is this is an important part of every single kind of detector for instance I'm trying to wear now a detector that detects sound waves and transduces it into electrical signals and then those electrical signals are sent to the system hopefully just once and with no delay uh in our case for, for instance we want to convert the energy that's deposited in the detector elements transform it into electrical signals and remember it's computer so it has to be digitized so having only a a wave is not enough you want to transform it into a string of bits and bytes yeah it's just going to be that lecture you know we're going to talk about adcs uh, error correction codes all the fun stuff this process of bringing the physical data the 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 the, the physical data of the particles inter that interact with our detector into the digital format in which makes some sense that it can be used by our comp uh, acted upon by our algorithm by our algorithms that run in our computers is what's called reconstruction i want to make this distinction here is not the only possible uh distinction that we can make but it's useful for pedag pedagogical purpose local reconstruction starts with the very the, the, the very act of reading out the detector then you have this charge deposited in a plate at the end of your at the end of your photodiode or something like that how do you actually get this charge out in form of a signal this is extremely detector dependent okay this even if even after you do the adc for instance so i have seven adc counts does, there, does anybody know does everybody know what adc is analog digital converter so it takes out something like oh it's 4 volts it translates into into 01100 and that you translate into a number and then this kind of information which physically has no no obvious meaning what does it mean channel 28 has seven counts and it transforms it into some kind of intelligible data a hit oh this particular part of the detector which is in this position has been hit with a total energy of 2 gv something like that this is local reconstruction this is completely detector dependent because for every part of our detector you will have uh, a specific translation this is very low level for instance for the tracker it really means nothing much more than oh a charged particle went to here 
But then this is still not physically meaningful. You really have to put all this information together. And this is the global reconstruction, where you started with heat, and you try to group them at a higher level. These are the examples, for instance. So, but if a particle passed through here, and here, and here, and here, and here, maybe it's obvious that what happened was something like this. If you have in your calorimeter energy here, and here, and here, and here, and here, Maybe you can make some kind of uh, clustering to come to the conclusion that what happened here was that a particle hit here and showered in these directions. And then there is a final level, which is global event description, where at some point you take oh, charged particles or calorimetric heats, and you make uh, a holistic reading of the whole event. So ah, I have a track in my, in my you, I, I will speak more about this later, it's just the, the introduction. You have a track in your silicon tracker, and at the same time you have a big energy deposit in your electromagnetic calorimeter. So what kind of particle is charged and dies in the electromagnetic calorimeter? An electron because electrons and photons die in the electromagnetic calorimeter, but only one of them is charged and could leave a track. It's this ki these kinds of things. Or you connect a track in two different tracker systems, for instance, in the, in the first one and in the last one, like I showed you before, and you know that the only particles that arrive in the end are the neons. So here you manage to reconstruct a neon. I'm going, obviously, I can, as I said, it's very detector dependent, especially the first part. I'm going to give you examples. But the overall idea is this, and as usual, stop me if anything is not clear. Before starting, uh, let's fix a coordinate system, okay? This one's the one we use at uh, CMF. At the other uh, <coughs> experiments, it's similar. LHCB may be different, I'm not completely sure. So imagine that this is the arc of the LHC. The part, the protons move here in both directions. They meet more or less here. And then you have these, these axes here. Z goes along the beam direction. X goes towards the center of the ring. And Y goes upwards. You could use X, Y, Z, but that's not smart. Because you want to use the fact that you have this symmetry here, because the particles are coming in this, uh, in this axis here. And this would immediately give you the need for the idea of using cylindrical coordinates, rho, psi, and z. Except that in Hadron Colliders, you don't know the actual starting energy, star, or initial momenta of the particles. Why is that? Because these guys here, that come here, they have some fraction of the momentum of the protons. And these fractions, they are unknown. So what's usually done is that you use a chord, there is a coordinate in special relativity, which is called, you may have heard of it, rapidity, that if you do boosts in the longitudinal direction, the rapidity is unchanged. So rapidity would be useful for us to use. Unfortunately, we also don't have access to the rapidity either. But we have the pseudo-rapidity, which is purely geometrical, and the definition is what's written there. It comes directly to, from, the <coughs> from the zenithal angle, from the theta. And I think there is a minus there that I forgot, sorry. But it doesn't matter because it's symmetrical. And on the limit of massless particles, the rapidity and the pseudo-rapidity, they, um, they coincide. So instead of having then x, y, z, or rho, phi, z, we, uh, we use rho, phi, eta. And this is the standard of the field, okay? 
in hadron colliders, lepton colliders or something else altogether because you don't have this problem of not knowing the initial momenta. You do, it's the moment of the beams. That said, let's start with local reconstruction. I'm going to use calorimeter as an example because it's harder. And to be absolutely clear, I'm going to speak about ECAL, the CMS Crystal Electromagnetic, Electromagnetic Calorimeter. So what's ECAL? ECAL is the second layer of CMS. It comes just after the tracker. It's made up of more or less 80,000 lead glass scintillating crystals. They are more or less this size, okay? They have something like 15 centimeters. But they're extremely heavy because, you know, lead and the thing stuff is also not, not that light. It's high density. It has very short radiation length. Remember radiation length is less than one centimeter. And they are 15 centimeters. So uh, approximating that by one, that means that if a shower goes into one side of the crystal, it comes out with one e to the 15 energy on the other side. So it's amazing, it, it managed to really stop the, the shower. A small Molière radius as well. I didn't explain Molière radius, but the idea is that it's related to the radiation length just on the transverse direction. So the shower is well contained, it's pencil-like, it doesn't spread a lot. It emits a lot of light very fast, 80% in 25 nanoseconds. It's blue and it's uh, transparent to blue. But it's not the perfect, there is no perfect material. The problem is that it emits 4.5 photoelectrons per MeV. Of course, of the, uh, what I mean is that you have the crystal and you have a photodetector here, and the light that arrives here just gives 4.5 photo, uh, photoelectrons, which, as you can imagine, is not that much charge. Okay, of course, there is GV, fine, there, but still 4,000 electrons is not that much. To read that out, you use photodiodes and phototriodes depending on the region. I'm going to explain about the region soon. And the idea is that the APDs use the photoelectric effect, remember that I spoke about that, such that when lighting things there, they give electrons. While the VPTs, they are your regular photomultipliers, but they have only one single stage. And this is what it looks like from the side. So there is a barrel up to eta equal 1.479. Then there is a crack. Why is there a crack? Because we cannot really, there are some cables that have to come through here, right? So there is a region which is less instrumented. There is no way to, to, to both uh, have your cake and eat it too. It goes all the way to Two point, uh, sorry, 2.6, that is the pressure. I'm, don't, I'm not going to speak about that. It's the uh, implementation detail. And then up to 3.0 for the end cap. Why do we have to divide into two places and have two different technologies for the readout? Remember, APDs and phototriodes, vacuum phototriodes. Opa. This thing has a field on the z-direction, solenoidal field. So more or less until here, until this vertical part, the field is solenoidal. It's constant. It's well behaved and it's nice. But at some point, the field has to turn around because it has to close. And that's what it does in the end cap. So in the end cap, the field is complicated. And it turns out that the APDs don't work very well in non uniform fields. So we have to use another, another technology. We could have a longer barrel, yes, but it's useless. At some point, you really have to close. And then again, you have to optimize for your budget. And it turns out that this was the best, uh, the best optimization. These are the kinds of questions that we have to think about when we are designing our detector, for instance, for the next experiment. Also, please notice that uh, this is only crystal. So this is a homogeneous calorimeter. The, the lead glass is both the absorber and the thing that shines. Okay. How do you actually read out? Remember, this whole thing was built to find the Higgs. 
So that means that you actually knew what kind of electrons you wanted to find. If you wanted to have, the Higgs was somewhere in between 100 GeV and 1 TeV of mass. If you wanted to search for it in, let's say, photon photon channel, right, Higgs to gamma gamma, that means that you would expect photons in more or less that range too. So if you run the calculation, it turns out that you wanted at least 12 bits in the output. 12 bits in the output, really, literally this, okay? So you would have, you would have at, at most two to the 12 different possibilities of uh, digital output. Turns out that if you want to have precision, you cannot re implement 12 bit, uh, with 12 bit you cannot have good precision in the whole range from one GV, no sorry, from let's say 50 GV to 500 GV. Because what, what do I mean? If I, if I want to count, let's say, to know the difference between 500 and 500.1, if I want to make all 0.1 GV difference all the way from 50 GV to let's say 1000 GV, you don't, two to the 12 possible values is not enough to give all the values here. And then you have to compromise. But if you compromise, you lose precision. Oh, what's the difference between 500 and 505? It's this kind of problem that I'm talking about. So what was chosen to do was to have multiple gain ranges to actually have in the electronics of the detector something that tells you, whoa, actually this, va this value that you're reading out has a prefactor of one, six, or 12 in front of it. And then in between, then you optimize the ranges and say, oh, for this range, you use the 12 gain. For this other range, low, uh, which is higher, you only need six. And for this other range, you need only one. This allows you to spend the whole range, and here what, you use uh, three bits, and then you have nine, but then with those nine, you can actually cover all of, the, all of the range with much more precision. And then you can have only one 12-bit ADC converter. And how does it actually look like? If anybody of you knows electronics, this should be easy for you. If you don't, I propose that you quickly take a look on how does, how does this work. But I want, what I want to show you is this right plot here that shows you the pulse shape. So when you actually have an electron or a photon impinge on the crystal, you have, first you have linearity. It, it, it doesn't show from this picture exactly, but let me explain you. You, it is proportional, the size of this pulse is, is proportional to the energy of the impinging particle. And the fact that you are in low, mid, or high gain, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, distort much your pulse. You see that uh, the three, for instance, for the three ranges, for the three gains, all the pulses look the same here. It's very subtle, but you see that there are three curves on top of each other here. Why is this important? Why, do, besides this fact that uh, you want to cover the whole, ra the whole range with one single ADC? The fact that it's a real physical system, so the performance of this thing changes in time. How does it change? It's a crystal, so if you're putting, uh, if you're putting it through a lot of radiation, eventually things are going to go black. And that's literally what happens. Our calorimeter is becoming Cold to first approximation. It's worse on the end caps. It's worse for high rapidities. Why? Because men, wh when you have the collision, most of the collisions actually give just a very few particles in a very forward region. So these guys here are the ones that suffer the most. And why this plot? This plot is the relative response to laser light, which is something that we use to calibrate, as function of time, more than year. And then you ha have here the first run of the LHC, the at seven and eight TV, and starting at 13 TV. It recovers a little bit when we let it recover. But you see that the response is always getting worse. 
how works? You can see this here is already 3%. Our crystals are only giving 3%. These crystals here in the extreme part of the cloud emitter, in the most forward, are only giving 3% of the light that they were giving compared to the beginning of the experiment. So if we didn't have this possibility of having dynamic gain, this part of the calorimeter would already be useless. And by the way, yes, we have to calibrate this two times a week. Because if we don't, then we are, then the calorimeter starts giving you the wrong values for the energy, and then it's useless. I wish it was more automated than it was, than it is. Now, okay, I managed to read out and I have some counts from the ADC. But again, what are channel crystal number 18,000, 2020, has 14 counts in gain three. Means nothing, right? So how do you translate this? So you have 12 bits for the ADC, bits to encode the gain. And for, we want to take 10 time samples. Let me explain this in a bit more detail. By the time that we send the signal, okay, let's, okay, okay, let's, let's read out, let's find out what's in the calorimeter. The LHC works discreetly, it works in units of bunch crossing, so every 25 nanoseconds. But just because 80% of the light is emitted in 25 nanoseconds, doesn't mean that you can just throw away the, the rest of the 20%. So what you have is something like this, and then it starts decaying. But remember that at the same time, you may have some energy from the previous one. And you may have another heat here, and all of these things sum together. How do you disentangle that? At first sight, you cannot. What is done is that first, you save 10 bunches, three, right? Three behind and seven after. It's going to change. So if you, if you find out that you want to change to measure the energy of the calorimeter at time zero, you save all the readings from minus 75 nanoseconds to 175 nanoseconds. And yeah, the electronics have to be precise to do this. And we want to estimate the energy of the heat, the time of the heat, and the position of the heat, which can be translated to four quantities. The amplitude, so the true peak of the shape, the pedestal, because you may have some sort of baseline deposit energy that's there, that, that is there more or less all the time, and then the peak is on top of that. The jitter, which is the actual time of this peak here, and these you can have with more, uh, with more precision than just 25 nanoseconds, because you may fit. And the chi-square of the fit. But still all of that all only gives you ADC counts. You still need to transform ADC to GEV. So you need a global calibration. And how is this done? This is usually done with uh, radioactive source. Nothing to be with that. With radioactive, radioactive source that give particles of, at a very well understood energy range. And then we still use intercalibration, where you use all the parts of the detector to calibrate each other. So here's what I want, here's what I mean. So in red, you have the true signal that you that you want to take, but then you have all of these out of time poles that are in other colors. The big blue, the deep uh, navy blue is the total, and here the observed points are the observed signal. So from the from this shape here, you want to disentangle just the red. What is usually done is that you do a multi-fit of all these pulse shapes at the same time. And uh, this multi-fit is the new thing that we started from 2015, because that gives you much more uh, precision in the heat time. 
with the weight method, which was something, something before, we also had some uncertainties because sometimes we would fail and actually get it on the minus 25, so in the previous hit or in the next one. And yes, it was a mess. But we still found the Higgs residual for both these ones. And then how do you calibrate? First, use either particles of very well-known mass, so you know that the pi zero has this mass of 135 MeV. So you search for photons, you put them together and you reconstruct a pi zero, and you can see here a beautiful peak of the pi zero in the, in the detector. You exploit the symmetry. You know that in the phi direction, that in the phi coordinate, there should be no difference. So you exploit that to intercalibrate all the crystals. And finally, you know that for most high energy particles, they are essentially massless at this energy range. So you, ex you use the other detector, you use the tractor, you measure the tractor, you use the momentum, and you exploit E over P is approximately equal to one for high energy electrons. Does it work? Of course. You see here that if you did them do the calibration, the mass of the pi zero would, would start to, to drift in time. And this is just one year. See, this is half a year, June to end of, an, end of November. And if you do calibrate, then you see that the mass actually is more or less stable, both for the pi zero and here you see also for the, uh, for the Z boson. This is an example of how to make a Higgs. Now the second part is how to put the Higgs, the Higgs together. And that is global reconstruction. And now here I'm going to again switch to the harder uh, thing. Let's talk about tracking. Tracking is exactly this thing that I do here. It's literally just connect the dots. But it's connect the dots extreme championship edition. So. Your, point, your idea is to obtain estimates for the momentum and position of the charged particle that made the hit. So you have to first do a translation of detector number 27 actually means a hit in XYZ space. And then there is a problem that there is misalignment. You think your detector is here, but it's actually here. So how do you know? Enter more calibration again. Again, this is just an example. You can, there are other ways that are, you can do, you also have global reconstruction, the calorimeter, global reconstruction, the neon system. But let's speak just about tracking here, which is traditionally divided in two steps. First, track finding. You have a set of hits all the hits in the detector, and you, want, you ask yourself the question, which subset actually makes a track? You have a billion hits, but let's say 10 of them are actually one track. 10 may be other, 10, another 11 may be other, and you don't know how many tracks, and you don't know how many hits are supposed to be in each track. So first you have to find the track. Second, given that you find a track, then you have to estimate the parameters, where the particle came from and what momentum it had. Easy, right? We just have to do come from here to here. Connect the dots. It's not easy, yes, it's a joke, especially in this particular case here. This is the future. This is from Atlas because CMS doesn't even give me a, a picture to put here. This is how tracking is going to look like in the high luminosity LHC, where you we will have uh, 200 simultaneous proton proton collisions. And uh, each of those collisions is going to give an average, something like a, a few hundred charged particles. So there will be tens of thousands of particles flying through your detector every 25 nanoseconds and you have to track them. So it's a bit complicated, but let's start with the easy thing. This is why you need a magnetic field, right? So if you want to know the momentum, the easiest way to, find, to have your momentum um, without changing it is by applying a magnetic field. 
use the Lorentz force and uh, run, go to town, run the, run the calculation. You actually make this, you parameterize by the path length instead of the time beams. This is already relativistic, right? And finally, you have this equation here. Now, if you have an inhomogeneous field, you are screwed because this is a conflict to second order differential equations in many variables, right? Because there is uh, three components here and three components here, a vector product, it's a mess. And you have to solve it and you probably will have to solve it numerically. But if you use a solenoid, and that's actually the reason why almost everybody uses a solenoid, <laughs> then it's easy, right? Because the, the you have a uh, helix. So you have the field uh, here, and your particle will just see here. And this is much easier. Not everybody uses a solenoid, of course, and this is tongue in cheek. Atlas, for instance, they have an internal solenoid for their first for the inner tracker, but for the muons they have something different. They are a toroidal large, uh, I don't remember the rest, but in fact they have a toroid in the end, okay? They have a big toroid for the muon system. LHCB is a dipole, you will see. But of course, you want to have good control over magnetic field, because even if you want to solve it numerically, you would prefer to have uh, things under control and stable. But in, in general, besides atlas, usually experiments are either solenoidal fields or dipole fields. And what's the, what's the difference? If you have cylindrical symmetry in your problem, like we have in LHC, then you want to use a solenoid that uh, respects the symmetry. So a particle will have a deflection only in the xy plane, or we can call it the whole phi plane if you want. Then you arrange your detectors in cylindrical shells. Remember that I showed you that cut of CMS. But this was the row phi view. Of course, if you go and, so, and look at it by, by side, it looks like uh, a barrel. And it's cylindrical shells one inside the other. And the idea is that these shells, they, uh, they are at constant row. So that's where you measure your trajectory. On the other hand, if you have a fixed target experiment, or in the case of LHCB, an experiment is just, just uh, thinking about the forward region, LHCB is like that because they are, think they are searching for Phenomena related to big hadrons, and those guys are mostly produced in the forward direction, so very high rapidity. So they have a dipole configuration instead. So they can afford to have a rectangular symmetry. The deflection is on the YZ plane instead, and they simply put a lot of parallel planes here to track the particle at fixed Z. This is actually a bit easier, okay, because in one of the in one of the coordinates, it's just a straight line. Here, in Solenodal, there is no choice. You really have to fit helixes. So, helixes, helixes we, oh, we must fit. Here is how you parameterize a helix. Lambda is the deep angle, which is this angle here, so this is Z. Here I put rho, but it's really the rho phi plane. This is the deep angle. H is just uh, if it's spinning clockwise or counterclockwise. And of course, it will project in this angle here. Sorry, in this plane here. It's a circle. Now, this is the important thing. In the transverse plane, so in the whole phi plane, x, y plane, we can relate. It can, you can run this, these numbers yourself. And you can add kt in GV, b in tesla, q in uh, elementary charge. And if you, and turns out if you add all the constants, this is a little bit uh, of a pain to make this calculation. If you put, because making calculations of the constants is a pain, but 
you get the R in centimeters already. And here, you can have some kind of idea of how big these detectors have to be, or not later, I'm sorry. But this is the master equation that we use here, our master's equation experimental physics are much easier. Master equation that we use for calculations in of transverse momentum in uh, Alex in solenoidal fields. Now, how do you actually find the tracks? Or to be more specific, let's go back here a second. We are not in this part yet, we are here. How do you find which dots to connect? Then finding out how they connect, doing the fit, something else. But how do you find which dots you connect? There are many ways to do it. I'm going to show you some of them. First, there is conformal mapping. So if you have a circle that goes to the origin, it will be, so, it will be something like this, which looks like a generic, uh, generic uh, circle, but you are choosing the A, or the A and B such that it goes to the origin. What you do is that you define this transformation here, which leads to this. And what does that help? You convert every hit of yours from the XY plane, XY coordinates, to UV coordinates. And what we will find out is that in this new coordinate system that is just defined here, the larger the momentum, the closer the line is to the origin. I will show you plots. Then what you do is that you say, oh, for high energy, that's what I care about, I will approximate the line as going to the origin. So the heat of a given track, they all have the same 5V. And then you histogram all the 5V and you search for peaks. Let's go for the example. So here you see, imagine that all of these are tracks, okay? Now, if I remember correctly, yes. So how, how is this? The red and the blue, they have the same momentum, okay? The, the magnetic field is coming out of the screen. The red and the blue particle, they have the same charge and the same momentum. What's the difference? The red particle came, uh, was created with an initial momentum or parallel to the x-axis. It has no y component. The blue one had a little bit of y momentum. But they have the exact same momentum. While these uh, dashed lines, they also have the same, the same uh, tangent here. They also are born in the horizontal axis, but they have lower and lower momentum. Now you do the mapping. The mapping again, the higher the momentum, the closer they are to their origin. You can see that the red line is closer than the first dashed line and closer than the second one. While the blue line has a different uh, tangent, so it has a different, a different uh, angular coefficient here, and, uh, but it crosses the, it crosses the x-axis in exactly the same point because it has the same momentum. And now the big approximation is, oh, let's look from far away <laughs> and actually say that this blue line is crossing through the origin, which is the dot here. But it's not true, but it is true enough for our purposes, and that's what's important. This already helps us because now when it, the, the, when these, these, and right, these, I didn't make the, the translation of the points, but these and these and these and these points that would be here would be translated to these and these and these and these points, which have more or less the same phi angle in these new coordinates. And how do these things show up? They show up by, if you make up a, a, a histogram of all of those, uh, all of the hits in your detector, you will notice that there are some peaks. They may be a bit wide because it's not exact, but then you may find these structures and say, oh, these guys make a track. It works. It's not perfect, but it's good enough for our, pur pur for our purpose, and that's all that matters. But then you can take this idea a little bit beyond. You can do what's called a half transform. 
And while the previous one, the conformal mapping, was is something that's only usable for illustrating purpose, yeah, nobody does that in practice. But the Huff transform is actually what we're going to do at CMS for the for the upgrade. So how to solve the Harry problem that I just showed you. Now, remember the master equation. We are interested just in the particles that come from the interaction point. Tiago, where else could particles come from? Yeah, they could come from, I don't know, a neutral particle that was flying for a little bit and then decayed. And then that, that those charged particles would not be coming from the interaction point. Or it could be a particle that hit one of the of my detector plates and then gave rise to more particles there that I can actually uh, track. I'm not caring about these people. I'm caring only about uh, particles coming from the origin, from the interaction point. Now, particles in the transverse plane that come from the origin, they are described by this equation here. And now this is in polar coordinates. Now, phi is the angle of the track in the transverse plane at the origin, so it's related to that tangent angle that I showed you before, right? So it's really open. It's related to this, the angle that it makes here at the origin. And in the other coordinates is this, okay? And then you make the small angle approximation. And how good is the small angle approximation? If you run the numbers, you'll find out that it's valid for tracks with PT above more or less 2 GV. 2 GV gives, gives a 1% error. 2 GV when you're colliding 14,000 GV center of mass is okay. So we can do this. Then if you do this, then you combine this equation with this equation, and you have this one, already making the, the, making the division. And what is this? This is a straight line, see? R and phi are the A and D coefficients, and the X and Y, this is, this is the dependent coordinate, and the independent coordinate is Q over PT. Solved, and fitting straight lines is easy. So that's what we do. Now again, if several hits are produced by the same particle, that means that all of the par all of the hits when you do this half transform, all of these guys one, two, three, four, five, six, they will translate to these lines here. And if they close, if they meet at a given point, that means that these guys form a track. And then the co the intersection coordinate will provide you the PT and the phi. There is a caveat, okay? Uh, the gradient of the line, if you come back here, it is proportional to the R. R is always positive. So this, uh, instead of having this nice, uh, we call this a butterfly for obvious reasons. What we would have is that many, number, many lines, all of them with positive coefficients. And then it doesn't, it's not as easy as to find the, inter, the intercept. So what we do is that we reparameterize like this, okay? Essentially we choose our coordinate system in whole such, in the whole coordinate such that half of the hits are, have positive RT and half of them have negative, and then the butterfly spreads its wings like this. And then it's much easier to locate the intersection. Tiago, this looks awfully complicated. Why, why are you doing it like this? Straight edge, straight line. Fitting straight lines is easy. Finding intersection like this is easy. And I will show you later that I want to do this blurry fast. There are some local approaches as well. I'm going to quickly speak about them. Track, the, the previous ones, they are global. You can run them over all of the hits at the same time. If you choose to start from a subset of the hits, say hits that are close by in eta phi space, what you can do is that you can start from hits that could be created from the same particle. For instance, you start with two green hits, these two green hits here, they are far away, and then you search for a given hypothesis, oh, the momentum is such, the interaction point is there. And you search for the hits in the road. You open up a small space here and you search. 
And if you find enough of them, you can say, okay, these guys are a good track candidate. Other thing that you can do is that you can start from, you can do track following. You start from a seed. Let's say that these detectors in the beginning here, they are better. Like they are in CMS, the detectors near the, the interaction point, they are better. So you trust them more, and with two or three, you already can do a three feet, and then start extrapolating and search for hits here, and here maybe you miss it because it was a little bit farther below, but then you found, you found, and then you can decide, okay, so these hits here make up a track. And there are other possibilities. Tracking is a real problem that, and it's going to become worse at the high luminosity LHC. Uh, I'm going to quickly speak about track fitting. Just a comment, okay? Uh, in the first lecture, I'm going to speak about machine learning. And CERN had put up, a, has anybody here heard of the Kaggle challenges? Okay, so, so Kaggle challenges, they are machine learning challenges that are put up by enterprise or usually, usually private firms. And they give a problem to the community and whoever wants to solve it can try to solve it. And then there is some judgment, automated judgment, like who can get the best accuracy or the best precision or so on. And the winning teams get money. <laughs> so there is an element of, uh, let's say, incentives. And CERN made one, okay? Let's g they gave us a bunch of hits and tried to find uh, and let the machine learning community try to track, to try to do the tracking. I think it was $20,000. Unfortunately, high energy physicists are not dumb and they also enter the competition. And it turns out that as of uh, last month, the machine learning methods are not good enough to solve the problem either. Regular tracking uh, technology won the competition, much to the chagrin of CERN. But th again, this is what everything that I'm showing you here does not scale for the high luminosity LHC. So we really have to make it work either with machine learning or I don't know what, <laughs> a miracle. It is really that bad. Uh, yes. Boom. Then you have to fit your track. Now you have decided, okay, this is a track, fine. How do I actually get the PT, the moment when the angle of the particle end? you have to parameterize your track and fit. And this depends on, again, the detector geometry. For the helix, we just use the five parameters that I showed you before. And then, one of the ways to do it is that you have to model the propagation of your track from one surface, so you measure your track here, 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 and here. You have to measure the propagation from one point to the other. And of course, it cannot do this, right? So maybe this point has an error. So maybe it was supposed to be here and then it's something smooth. But how do you judge? How do you judge? Of course, uh, this is already a solved problem, the propagation of a, of a system in the presence of errors. And then you have to do the error propagation of all your hits and take into account that something bad may happen during one of the interactions. The stuff like material effects, uh, multiple Coulomb scattering, uh, catastrophic Bernstrahlung. Even all of, with all of these things, if you can have a track model that tells you how the particle moves from one point of measurement to the other, and how does the particle passing from one, passing through that, uh, that detector gives rise to a signal, which is the track model and the measurement model, you can iterate this and have a complete uh, modeling of your track. Now, uh, I'll speak more about this later, but uh, this is the complicated thing. Let's start with the simple. By the way, uh, 
this, uh, this thing that I'm going to talk to you is called a common filter. Yeah, this is a spoiler. It's common filter. And this is used in robotics. What do I mean? I have a robot that's moving from point A to B. And then it tries to move, but then it stops and checks. Just because it told it to move it there doesn't mean it got there. Maybe there was a problem. So it actually uses GPS or measurements or whatever and double checks, wait, where am I? And then it checks the, its position. But then even that, that check may have measurement errors. So it has to do a weighted average. And then, okay, then I go. And then it moves again. And then you iterate. And that's how you are able to write programs for robots that move in the real world. Now, all of these uh, framework can also be used for particles, which I'll be showing later. But first, let's do something simple, and then we go to the complicated. Remember, if you want to measure your momentum, you have two different things. You have in the, in the transverse plane, you have this curve here, that is projection of the ellipse. But in the row z plane, you only measure this deep angle here. So this is easy because here you just fit a asteroid line. And so here you get the deep angle, easy. Now here it's complicated. How do you get the, the momentum? You have the formula. Turns out that, bless you, turns out that me uh, even, if the me even doing the measurements is hard because already for a PT of one GV, if you have a large field, not as large as the mass, but let's say two tesla, the radius of duration is 1.7 meters. And one GV is nothing. For 10 GV, something that could come out of the Higgs boson, is 16 meters. 16 meters is more or less uh, the height of this, it's cool, is more or less the height of this uh, auditorium, right? More or less? So, this is the radius of duration. And you have a particle that's bending like this. But that means that if you magnify this picture, these points actually curve very little. How do you solve this? This was solved by Italians, of course. You define this star guitar here, and then you have the trigonometry here that you can run over, it's easy. And assuming you have a track length of one meter, you will see that for a PT of one GV, you have a target of seven centimeters. So, one meter, what I'm telling you is that this height here is seven centimeters. For 10 GV, this height here is one centimeter, which even in my drawing is almost indistinguishable from a straight line. And why do you want this track length? Because remember, you're tracking in the silicon. And silicon is expensive. You cannot have 17 meters of silicon. Nobody has the budget. So you, ha you have to make do with shorter track than what you would like. But then you are trying to measure a deviation of one centimeter from a straight line. And the higher the energy, the, the smaller the fajita. Up to the task. Then, after you, uh, after you measure the two things, the fajita and the deep angle, with the fajita you have the PT, with the deep angle you have the lambda. And, go ahead. No, if you have a, so, the radius of the ratio is proportional to the PT. The higher the momentum, the higher the radius of the ratio. But the radius of the ratio is this thing here. So, you have the same length, the same arc length of the circle here. But now this thing is 10 times higher. So this thing now, this blue part is almost straight. 
this s is very small. See what I mean now? Anybody, anybody else? Then if you have the PT and you have the deep angle, you just divide one by the other, the cosine, and you have the full momentum. Then you do error, um, error propagation, you know the drill, and uh, this is the final error in the, in the momentum. The error, the error in the deep angle is super small because again, it's just hitting a straight line. There is almost no mistake to be done there. But the error in the radius of duration and therefore in the sagita is the thing that drives the, the error in the momentum. Usually we don't need to think about the momentum, the whole momentum itself and just uh, on the, about the transverse momentum because as I told you, the elementary process, they happen among partons that are not in rest in the lab frame. You don't know the, the longitudinal momentum of the original parton, so you don't really care much. But for the transverse momentum, it's fundamental. And this is what I told you about the Kalman filter. Now I have good pictures. So you start with a seed. In red, you predict the next, the next traje trajectory, but turns out that you need to consider the measurement in black, and then you have to make do with these two, with these two predict, with these two ideas of where the particle is. You merge them, you usually take a weighted average, and you filter, and then you iterate, predict, measure, filter, predict, measure, filter. And in the end, you come back and you smooth and you make a final fit. And that's how it's actually done. Now, these are three pictures, of course, but uh, these, th there are actually the equations for this, which I am actually think I'm not even going to try to go through this. I just want to tell that the size of the matrices that are related here are these. You have C parameters for the track model in the case of the helix size. You have D measurements at each point. Usually you have three because you have a measurement in a 3D space. Unless you have, uh, unless you have some very particular geometry where you only care about tracking in two dimensions. You have K measurement points. You just write your system equation like this where this G guy is the one that takes you from one, measure, from one measurement to the other, the arrow. And if you, if you plug all the parts together, you have this simple, simple equation here. And this you can leave your computer to solve. Okay, we measure the track, the momentum with the tracker, and we measure the energy of the calorimeter, which is good, right? We have two. E and P, we have the four vector already. Now we have to put everything together. So we have tracks in the silicon, calorimeter heat, minute per kilometer tax. We want to correlate all of these guys to identify all the finer state particles. Remember the particle, the eight or nine particles that we discussed before. We want to find the list of those particles that were produced. Now, this was not invented by CMS. It was invented by Alice in lab. It's called the particle flow, which is a holistic way of taking into account all the measurements in a set, in a more or less with the same, uh, with the same weight. It was thought it was impossible to be done in Hadron Colliders. In Tevatron, it didn't work. Why? Hadron Colliders, they are dirty in the sense that the collision of two hadrons leaves, leaves a lot of debris. The protons break up, then there is hadronization, showering for those parts, it's all QCD, there is a lot of junk flying around. Lepton colliders are clean in comparison. So the main idea is that first you do the obvious thing, like electrons leave tracks, both tracks because they're charged and electromagnetic calorimeter deposit. Photons leave only the latter. Mions leave tracks in both systems. Absolutely. Now, charged hadrons, in general, they leave tracks because they are charged in hadronic calorimeter deposit, while neutral hadrons only the latter. One of the key things is remembering, if I have a hadron, which is a track plus a deposit in the hadronic calorimeter, 
I don't need to think, oh, the, hadro, the energy of the hadron is just this. You can make a weighted average of these two things somehow. You can be smart. But not, but not too much smart, right? Because maybe there is a shower and there is extra deposits. So there is some fine tuning to be done on how much of this energy you relate to the track and how much of this is, for instance, Brem Spralo of this guy that gave a photo. Uh, this is an algorithm that has to be written and tuned. It's a pain, but it can be done. It's worth in CMS. And in the end, the output is a list of final state reconstructed particles. Exactly what your generator, if you're doing phenomenology, this is exactly what your generator produces for you. So now it's nice because you can run the same analysis in the gen a generator level or at reconstructed level. Does it work? Let's let, let the data speak for themselves. This is the actual reconstruction of the co plus the tractor, okay? So these are Zs, Z bosons decaying into two electrons. And here you can see the electromagnetic momentum, the transverse momentum in the Ikao barrel. Here you can see the pseudo rapidity. Here, look at the crack that I just showed, talked to you about before. And here you have the mass of the Z boson. The black points are data, the full histograms are the simulation, and uh, one over the other. I think it's good, eh? I think it's, it works. One comment. Hadron colliders, since they, in the end you have a lot of colored particles, right, QCD stuff, they give rise to jets. So they give rise to hadrons in the final state that I spoke to you before. The hadrons that are produced by the parton, by the showering hadronization of a given gluon or quark, they more or less fly together in the same direction. But part of those guys is neutral, so you cannot track them. So what used to be done before and in Tevatron was that you used only the calorimeter to, do, to, to measure the, the jets. And it was suboptimal. It worked, but it was not good enough. Now, with particle flow, you can actually run the same algorithm. And what's the JET algorithm? It's an iterative tunable, but it's a procedure that closes, that clusters particles that fly together. And then it, it tells you, this is a JET. Of course, it's tunable. You can tell it how close those particles have to be. But that's something that the theoretical calculations can help you decide the parameters. In the same vein, you can cluster all the particles that were observed. And this allows for important cross-check. If energy is conserved, right? Momentum is conserved. But remember, you don't know the initial longitudinal momentum. You don't. It may be a situation like this, but in the transverse moment, in the transverse plane, the momentum should be conserved. So this is what we do. We sum all the particles, the observed particles in the event, and the transverse momentum should be zero. And if it isn't, either something went wrong, and of course there is measurement error, or something escaped from your detector, like a neutrino. Or if you're searching for supersymmetry, maybe that's a sign of a neutralino, or dark matter. Or maybe a particle went into the extra dimensions and therefore it doesn't appear in your detector anymore. And no, the, 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 this particular one is not a joke. That's how I searched for extra dimensions. Not found. So we also define this missing transverse momentum here as minus the sum, the vector sum of all of the mo transverse momentums of all particles. And we take the modulus of this the absolute value of this thing. Here's what I mean by calorimeter jet. See, so these are more, these I'm not completely sure. I think each of these is a crystal and the height of the, and the color are related to the energy deposited in that crystal. This is Atlas. And you see here a jet, see? This is eta the, and this is phi. And you see here that a lot of particles deposit their energy together. This is a jet. 
And here you have a digest event in CMS. Now you have both the, the, the calorimeter and you have the track, but you can run particle flow and have a holistic view, which is what's here. Sorry, these plots are not that nice, but the idea is exactly that. You link, you link the track with the electromagnetic deposit, with the hadronic deposit, and you use the full granularity to come to the conclusion that, oh, this is a K long, this is a pi on plus, this is a pi, neutral pi on the decay into two photons. And you can use those particles to run your jet algorithm. Your jet algorithm runs over anything that, that is a four vector, okay? Uh, second to last comment. All of this reconstruction, you can do it after you take the data and run it, uh, it takes some time, but it's fine. You have, you have a lot of computer power. Unfortunately, we cannot take all the data because it, it's 40 megahertz of uh, collisions. Each collision produces data more or less around one megabyte. And then uh, I'll leave uh, 40 mega, giga, tera, something like 40 terabytes per second. Yeah, not going to happen, right? There is not enough disk. There is not enough uh, Ethernet cables. That it, you cannot take that kind of data. It's impossible. So what we have to do is that we have to run all of this stuff that I have just showed you quick online with the data on buffers and then quickly decide if you accept the event and save it on the, on the tape or you throw it away forever. And forever is really the only ir irreversible thing in the experiment. We always save the raw data. But if we didn't because it didn't pass the trigger, and this is what we call it the trigger, it's lost forever. So I have this trigger system that keeps only the most interesting one. It's quasi real time. In CMS, you have it in two levels. Either it's level one, which is built upon custom electronics, FPGAs, ASICs. It's essentially a hardware, specialized hardware, electronics that does all of that that I showed you very fast and then says, okay, save the event or not. Now, this thing, the level one, reduces from 40 megahertz to 100 kilohertz. It has to do its work for every event in four microseconds. So all of that that I showed you, four microseconds. And it doesn't have access to the whole detector, to the whole granularity of the detector. So it doesn't read every crystal. It reads them in groups and makes some sum, instant sum. And then you have the high level trigger, which is uh, this software. It runs on a cluster. It runs the same software that we have offline. And it has to output at most one kilohertz over every time that the LHC runs. And it has to do all its work in more or less 380 milliseconds. But this guy actually runs exactly the same thing that we run offline, but tuned to do it faster with less precision. And here you see the HLT rate during a, an LHC field. So it, it starts above, it starts at 1600 uh, hertz, going all the way down to 500. And here you see the timing histogram. The average, here it was nice, it was good times. It was 150 milliseconds, but you have a long tail. Some events take a lot of time to be reconstructed. What matters is the average, because if, we, if the average goes too high, then the, clu the cluster fills up. We don't have enough computers to take the data. And with all of these, assuming you have taken the data, you manage to fully reconstruct the, uh, reconstruct the event. So PT bar would appear as new CEP, the uh, absolute value of that missing, uh, missing transverse momentum that I showed before, jet, another jet, an electron here, see the red uh, bar is a lot of electromagnetic energy, and a mu because it managed to escape all the way here. Everybody's here. That's how you reconstruct the data. That's how you go from data in the, the interaction of the particles on the detector to real physics objects that you can use. Now what's left is the fun part, data analysis that will happen, that I'll talk to you about it tomorrow. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, thank you very much.
missing, missing transverse energy, which makes no sense whatsoever because there is a scalar, it doesn't have transverse, but it's Darwin, the missing transverse momentum, yes. No, in truth, we cannot know, but it is conceivable that when there, were, there was a random distribution of energies here, and turns out that most of the energies came be, uh, went to the true neutrino. But in every event, you have some missing T. The difference is that most of the time, it's uh, experimental error, and you have to live with it. But 164, is already a bit large. And this is something that you have to really work there to develop this theory. There, there are cross-checks that you can do. For instance, you can, you can look at the eta phi plot of your detector, opa, and then you notice that every once in a while holes appear. <laughs> and then you say, what's happening? And then you have to go, and this is in line, why are you taking the data? And then you have to call somebody in the middle of the night and tell them, listen, the part four of the calorimeter stopped working, and then people have to fix it. After you do all of those things, then you can start tr trusting the missing T. Do you want to explain the reason you accept it? Mm -hmm. Louder, please. There are many, many, many ways of calibrating the tracker. Uh, sometimes you calibrate them with cosmics, because you know that uh, cosmics are always new, so they are well behaved. And then you can just correlate and make sure that they cross the detector in whatever, whatever you see here has to correlate with whatever you see on the other side. You can correlate, the, you can calibrate it with real particles, just like we did in the electromagnetic calorimeter. You can do it with, uh, with tracks, particle by particle. You know that the two electron tracks should be the mass of the zip, for instance. And many, many other ways. We can calibrate it in situ while we are running, and we calibrate it uh, in special calibration work. Lovely, everybody understood everything. Best lecture ever. <laughs> okay, so let's do the following. Why don't you go to the coffee break <laughs> and, uh, and continue there? It's now, right? So we can speak more about in the coffee break. Thank you very much. <laughs>